But the title of my message this morning is Love That Lasts a Lifetime, which uh, seems like it doesn't happen about half the time. You know, about uh, last I heard around half of the marriages uh, are ending in divorce. I think that figure is going down. I think it's shrinking a little bit, praise God. But in some uh, age groups, it's actually going up. The 50 and over group, folks that are 50 and over, that age group, the divorce rate has doubled since the 1990s. You know, the highest divorce rate is those that have been married a year or less. The second highest, those that have been married 20 years or more. And a lot of times they just stay together for the kids. When the kids are gone, bam, they're, you know, they don't have a relationship. And so they say, see you later. But people, I think, sometimes have kind of the messed up idea that, you know, if I get married and it doesn't work out, well, I just got the wrong one. I got a jerk this time. And so let's just trade him in or trade her in and uh, try this thing again. The problem is divorce rates go up on the second and the third marriage. Did you know that? You know, the second marriage, your divorce rates are up in, you know, 60%. Third marriage, maybe up even into the 70%. uh, How many believe that love can actually last a lifetime? How, How many have been married 25 years or more? Would you stand if you've been married 25 years or more? Hey, look at that. Is there anybody that's been here that's been married 40 years or more? Anybody? 40 years or more. Hallelujah, yeah. So it is indeed possible. Love can last a lifetime. If you've been married 25 years or, or more, you've probably had plenty of, op- plenty of opportunities to call it quits, right? Uh, j- just to give up. It hasn't been easy, but you've stayed together because you have made some choices. I'm going to talk about choices today. You made some choices. You know, anybody can fall in love, right? It's kind of like falling in a ditch. Oops, fall in a ditch. Oops, f- fell in love. But it's a whole different story about staying in love. To stay in love, you've got to make quality to sh- Uh, decisions and make those choices again and again probably every single day Mark Twain said you don't know the depths of love until you've been married 25 years or more and if you've been married let's say 25 years or 40 years I tell you your love has been tested amen (laughs) tested by demands and distance and pressure and pain but it stood the test I heard one uh, one couple on their 40th anniversary, a husband rolled over in bed and said, Honey, I am so proud of you. And she responded, Honey, I am tired of you too. <laughs> you know, they say the hearing is the first to go. So, <laughs> Love can last a lifetime when you remember that it's not a feeling. Love produces feeling, but it's not a feeling. Fe- love is a choice. God could not command us to love. It was if, simply a feeling that we did not control. But he does command us to love one another. And love is making choices day after day that benefit the other person that you are married to or living in the home with you. So the question that comes to my mind is, why is it that so many marriages are dying? And what is it that makes a marriage last, like these couples that stood up? Is there some ingredients that will glue and cement our lives together and our love together for a lifetime? I believe the answer is true, yes. So this morning, I want to give you six ingredients, and they're really choices when you think about it, but six ingredients that we can make each day to make our love last a lifetime. You know, I believe, I thought this popped into my head this morning when I was thinking over this, that the quality of our marriage, the quality of your marriage And the duration of your marriage is completely in your hands. Do you understand that? The quality of your marriage. You you can determine the quality of your marriage. You also determine the duration of your marriage. And if you do these six things that I'm going to talk to you about this morning, right out of the Bible, principles right out of the Bible, I can guarantee it will divorce-proof your marriage. So here's the first ingredient, number one, is is acceptance. 
acceptance. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another, then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. How's the sound? Is it, is it all right? It's, I don't know what we can do. Um, I don't flatten it out or something a little bit, just kind of a little bit of a echo or something. It's easy to get distracted up here by little things like that. It's funny. Anyway, accept one another. You don't have to turn it down, but just EQ it just a little bit. Romans 15, 7, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. We are to accept one another just as Christ accepted us. How did Christ accept us? I mean, unconditionally, right? And then it says when we accept one another, it actually brings praise to God. Why would you and I, as married people or even in, in relationship, when we accept one another, why would that bring praise to God? Well, I think one of the reasons is because you don't see it in the world. It's not happening out there. People are not accepting one another unconditionally. It's all about performance. You have to perform for my, my acceptance. But when the world sees a couple or they see a group of people or a family living in acceptance of one another, despite all, our, all of our weakness and all of our flaws, somehow it brings glory and praise to God. They, don't, they see through us, and they see something bigger than us. And acceptance is so important because, you know, 70% of the people that get married marry their opposite, right? They marry people that, that are just, just different than you. And that's not a bad thing. Somebody once said that if you marry somebody and they always agree with you, then one of you is unnecessary, right? And I question it sometimes, and I've heard people say, well, we never get in an argument. You know, we never fight. We've been married for 30 years, and we've never had a fight. Well, I'm thinking either one of you is not breathing, <laughs> or you're making compromise. You're compromising yourself all the time in order just to keep peace in the home, and that's only going to last so long before resentment sets in, and uh, resentment will kill your marriage. You know, the differences that attracted you, and we mentioned this last week, attracted you to your mate will eventually end up annoying you and irritating you when you have to live with that person 24 hours a day, right? You know, couples, they'll say, you know, before we got married, I had so much in common with my mate. Now we have nothing in common. Anybody? I see a couple elbows going like that. You know, couples, it's amazing what happens when you're, when you're dating. You know, the wife will, for some reason, just love to go fishing with her husband. She'll actually get in there and look over the hood of the car or inside the car when he's working on the, on the motor, you know, and ask questions. Well, what's that, honey? And can I help you? Well, guess what? Once they tie the knot, she never picks up a fishing pole again and certainly doesn't get anywhere near a wrench. Isn't that, isn't that true? But so many couples get married believing that the things that they don't like about their mate are just magically going to disappear when they get married. I've got a word of encouragement for you today. If you can't live with somebody just the way they are right now, please don't get married. Because there's no guarantee that they're going to change. There's no guarantee that those things that irritate you don't like are ju just simply uh, going to go away. So here's the question. Do you accept your mate's differences? You know, differences aren't bad. They're just different, and, and it's a good thing when your mate has a different opinion than you, or some, you know, maybe some different values or a different way of looking at things. And acceptance is so essential in marriage because guess what? We're all imperfect. We all have flaws. We all have character weaknesses, physical flaws, emotional flaws, yet there's something in us that cries out to be accepted by our mate, to be accepted by other people. One of the most healing things things that can happen in a marriage is when your mate accepts you despite all of your flaws and no one knows you any better than your mate right you know uh my my wife really actually demonstrated this to me well she has in actually a lot of different ways but one of the things that was important to bobby before she got married uh, before we got married she had dated a bunch of guys several different guys and uh, one of the things that was important was their teeth 
she has nice white teeth, and she wanted whoever she was dating, and certainly whoever she's going to marry, to have nice, straight, white teeth. And then she met me. And I don't have a straight tooth in my head. I mean, it just, it's just the way it is. I, I don't know. You know, I asked my mom one time after I grew up, why didn't you get me braces as a kid? And she said, well, the dentist that we were going to said that you didn't need, den- uh, didn't need braces. And I thought, what on earth? That dentist must have been sitting in the, in the chair in between patients and just sucking on the laughing gas or something and overdosing on that stuff. When I walked in, don't need braces. I don't know what he was looking at. I mean, my teeth go in like 14 different directions. But somehow, when we met, she overlooked all that and accepted me anyway. And my teeth were always just kind of a, you know, kind of a point of shame, really, in some ways, to me, or embarrassment, you know. I never really liked to laugh. I never, you know, liked to smile when I was growing up because I had buck teeth, you know. I had crooked teeth. And, uh, but yet, through that acceptance, you know, it was healing uh, to my soul. We need acceptance, don't we? We need our mates and our family and our friends to just love us for who we are. Acceptance says, I accept you despite all of your faults, all, all of your flaws, all of your faults. Romans 14, 13 says, stop judging one another. And if we don't stop judging one another, we're going, to nag each, we're going to nag our marriage to death is what's, what's going to happen. And so the first ingredient is accept one another. Very, very powerful, very powerful choice. Secondly, we need to add the ingredient of attention into our marriage. These are just some foundational things. There's nothing profound that I'm going to share here today, but if nothing else, it's just a good reminder or the things that you probably probably already heard that we need to do. But we all need attention. 1 Peter one twenty two says, Love one another deeply from the heart. None of this surface stuff, but love one another deeply from the heart. Over 16 times, the Bible says, love one another. I think Jesus is trying to get our attention. And one of the ways that we show love to one another is to show attention, to give attention to one another. Everybody needs attention, right? You know, when your kids were small or when you were small, you remember saying, uh, you know, Daddy, watch me. You're jumping on the trampoline or Mommy, Mommy, watch me. And you know when you grow up, guess what? That need for attention doesn't go away. It just changes a little bit, just gets a little bit more sophisticated. You know, the world is saying, watch me in so many different ways. They're, They're saying, watch me by the car that I drive, by the house that I live in. You know, watch me by the uh, diplomas that I got on the, on the wall, the plaques that I have, listing all my accomplishments. Do you remember how much attention that you gave your now mate, but when you guys were dating, how much attention that you gave each other before you were married? I mean, that's crazy. Compare that to now. It's ridiculous. You were totally absorbed in one another. You know, if you go to the park, for instance, public place, you can always tell the married people and the before married people. You know, the pre-married people, they're the ones that are hanging all over each other. Man, they're enamored with one. They're totally oblivious to what's going on. They don't care. They are so focused, giving each other undivided attention. And somehow that goes away when we get married. It shouldn't. We need to bring it back. If you want some spark in your marriage, how many need some spark in your marriage today? Come on. I really didn't expect anybody to raise their hands, but I know.